You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 17, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, DRESS, or Drug Reaction with the Eosinophilia and Systemic Symptoms Syndrome. Our presenter is Kate Robin. She's a fourth-year medical student on the Allergy Immunology Rotation at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Robin, I'm a fourth year medical student at Des Moines University and I've been doing my allergy immunology rotation for Children's Mercy for the last month. So I'm just going to give a quick talk on DRESS syndrome. So this is a drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. I think it's the right arrow key. Right arrow key? Yeah. But click on the PowerPoint first. There you go. Okay. All right. So this is a severe adverse drug induced reaction potentially life-threatening with multi-system inflammation, including fever, cutaneous eruptions, hematologic abnormalities, and internal organ involvement. Um, a main criteria of this syndrome is the delayed onset, so it usually presents two to six weeks after the starting of a new drug, with persistence of the symptoms continuing despite um, stopping the drug. So a little bit about the history of DRESS. Um, first documented cases with um, similar symptoms were linked to hydantoin drugs in the early 30s. Um, several names for these similar syndromes have come up over the years, um, which leads to a little bit of confusion about the nomenclature, but other names that have been referred to as drug hypersensitivity, drug-induced multi-organ hypersensitivity syndrome, the anticonvulsant syndrome, and then a drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, or DIHS, which you may be more commonly or be more familiar with. So DRESS was first introduced as a new term in 1996 to decrease the equivocality of all of these terms. Um, just a quick note, the DIHS and DRESS are, are very similar, but the DIHS is considered a more severe, um, a, a severe type of DRESS. So the pathogenesis is not completely understood, but there's a few proposed mechanisms out there, one being um, an abnormal breakdown of drug metabolites causing T cell function abnormalities, another being inherited deficiency of epoxide hydroxylase, which converts the arena oxide to transhydrodiol. Also, a slow acetylation process may be producing um, toxic metabolites. More commonly reported and more, um, I guess, more research being done is in the area of reactivation of human herpes virus, including Epstein-Barr and human herpes virus, the six and seven strains. Um, a little bit more about the human herpes virus reactivation because it seems to be more prevalent in the literature. There was a re review done just last year that analyzed 172 cases of DRESS, and the primary um, reason for the study was to classify DRESS based on certain characteristics. So they were looking at, um, at the diagnostic criteria in each of the reported cases in the literature and um, classifying them as probable or definite cases or, or not a case of DRESS. But in analyzing this data, they found that 50% um, of the cases did detect um, F, and I heard human herpes virus infection. And of the ones that were tested, 80% um, were positive for it. So there was an increase in the IgG titer, which um, may indicate a reactivation of the virus. Also, interestingly, a couple years ago, um, in a prospective study with 40 participants, 76% of the patients had reactivation of either human herpes virus 6, 7, or Epstein-Barr. So this study um, found that in all patients, circulating CD8-positive T cells were activated. There was increased cutaneous homing markers and an increased secretion of TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. Um, also noted in this study was that the higher cytokine production was also associated with more visceral involvement. And we'll talk a little bit more about the diagnostic criteria here in a minute. So they concluded from this study that um, the cutaneous and visceral symptoms of duress were mediated by the activated CD8 positive lymphocytes and directed against EBV. So. so what drugs do we commonly see in DRESS syndrome? The ones on the left are more commonly reported. So we have the top three being your anticonvulsants that are most commonly reported to be associated. Also allopurinol, sulfalazine, and minocycline. Allopurinol seems to be more reported with um, serious, more serious clinical outcomes than the others that are reported as well. 
So the drugs on the right, and this is not a comprehensive list, there are other drugs um, that have been reported, but these ones have been associated with the more definite cases of drugs. So um, the diagnostic criteria for this syndrome um, come from a registrar scoring system. This is a European registry that kind of set out to delineate the difference between other severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. So they're looking at differentiating between like Stephen Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, and the acute eczematous <laughs> pustulosis, um, and a few others. But so they came up with a scoring system with a fever, skin rash, hyperosinophilia, atypical lymphocytes, lymphadenopathy, and internal organ involvement. Um, and that includes involvement of the liver, kidney, muscle, heart, uh, pancreas, lung, and other organs. And the last criteria is that the resolution is greater or equal to 15 days. So um, it's more indicative of dress if um, the syndrome lasts longer than 15 days. The um, criteria with the asterisks next to them indicate the ones that are significantly associated with the probable or definite cases of dress in that review article that we um, talked about earlier. So the differential, you can see, I mean, a lot of these are pretty nonspecific symptoms in terms of you could mistake them for other syndromes. So it's a short list of the differential that you might also think of with similar symptoms include um, the ones we've kind of discussed, as well as Kawasaki's disease and Stills disease. So this is a, just, this is kind of a busy slide, but it's the table that was used from the literature review that I've referenced um, in terms of defining either definite, probable, possible, or no case of dress. So you can see that the diagnostic criteria kind of depends on a few specific things. So if the eosinophil count plays a role in being more probable or not, um, the rash involvement in terms of body surface area, the skin rash more suggestive of dress, and then, of course, a biopsy and then liver, kidney, muscle, heart, pancreas involvement. So some, since some of these symptoms can be confusing, they also recommend doing a few other tests to rule out other possible causes of these symptoms. OK, so what does the rash look like? It's not exactly, it's not clearly defined, but more often than not, it's described as a progressively widespread erythematous maculopapular rash with scaling or exfoliation. Um, there are many other reported definitions or descriptions, um, including bullous and um, pustular rashes. So there's no pathognomonic rash for the syndrome, but a lot of them seem to report the scaling and peeling of the skin, so it seems to be pretty important. Facial edema only occurs in about a third of them, but um, it's important to make note of. And if you were to do a skin biopsy, it's pretty nonspecific, but does show lymphocytic infiltration of the papillary dermis which may contain eosinophil. So other organ involvement, um, a basic set of labs to get if you're concerned for dress, um, CBC, LFTs, creatinine, urinalysis, and a TSH. Um, the liver is most commonly involved, more so than the other organs. And liver enzymes tend to be about 9 to 10 fold higher than normal. Um, hepatomegaly also may be noted. So other involvement um, includes interstitial nephritis, carditis, pneumonitis, and thyroiditis. It's also kind of a busy slide, but just to give you a general idea of you know, all the other drugs that can cause eosinophilia and the drug reaction associated with each drug. So um, just eosinophilia cannot be a diagnostic um, marker, but along with other <laughs> symptoms that are reported may point you more in the right direction. So how do we treat this? Um, probably stopping the offending agent is the most important thing to do. And um, it's been reported that there's more positive outcomes with, um, I guess, more quickly stopping the drug. Systemic corticosteroids are indicated. There is no clear um, dosage or route or um, anything like that. There are many reported therapies of corticosteroids, so different types. Route duration seems to be about um, a few weeks to a few months. Um, it t typically seems that they're started on IV steroids and then sent home on oral taper um, for the next couple weeks to months, but there's no clear-cut um, guidelines on that yet. There are no actual randomized controlled trials for the treatment of DRESS yet either, so um, maybe in the future we'll have a better idea. But other treatments include just antipyretics and then good skin care, especially if they have the exfoliative type of rash. And really they just recommend treating any as you would for a burn. 
Um, the corticosteroids, as we just talked about, um, kind of they inhibit the effect of IL-5 on the eosinophil accumulation. And um, in independent case reports, they've just seen dramatic improvement with the use of steroids. And also have seen relapses after tapering or withdrawal of the steroids, which may mean that they're not treating long enough. But um, they also show the importance of the drug. So there's a few future therapies out there that have been um, recommended. Alpha interferon, which is second-line therapy in the use for idiopathic hypereosinophilic syndrome. And when it's used as second-line therapy, it's also used with corticosteroids. So um, it may play a role in dress. Um, N-acetylcysteine is um, involved in the detoxification of several drugs, including the anticonvulsants. So if you are suspecting an anticonvulsant-induced reaction, then um, maybe NAC would be a, a good choice. It also modulates the production of cytokines and ICAM-1 expression in the keratinocytes so it may help with the rash, too. Um, NAC is you know, considered a pretty safe drug, so there are more reports of this being used as more of like an experimental or um, just to kind of see, what, see if it might help the patient. Um, but there was a few reported cases of an onset of angioedema when starting the NAC. So they had had angioedema and then, um, and then started the corticosteroid, the angioedema improved, and then they started NAC and the angioedema came back. So it may be a reason um, to confuse the picture, <laughs> but also may be helpful. So there's also primary prevention um, out there that, you know, there's a, a theory that lamotrigine, um, if you escalate the dose of that anticonvulsant too fast, then you can get a rash. And so maybe we could avoid this syndrome altogether in, in medications that we know to cause stress if we just started low, a low dose and escalated more slowly. There also may be a family um, counseling component to this, if, if there's a genetic factor to the detoxification of drugs, then maybe um, by knowing that your family has this predisposition, um, you may be able to better avoid it. And then a more costly and maybe unrealistic way of looking at lymphocytes would be to do a toxicity assay and see if they would respond to these drugs before you even started giving them the drug, but maybe a little more unrealistic. And then, of course, secondary prevention. If this is a drug they need to be on and there are no other alternatives, is there a role for desensitization before getting these drugs to avoid dread? Um, this is a patient that apparently was seen at Children's Mercy. Dr. Portner gave me this picture and said that the kid came in with um, a dress syndrome, and these were a bunch of homeopathic medications that this um, patient was on. And so it may not be easy to single out the one drug that's causing dress. Um, if this is the picture that um, you get on history. So. <laughs> All right, and those are a few references. So. Very good. Okay. 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 Yeah. Did you cancel by using IVA? No, I didn't. I mean, you know, it's used, I think, in cases where they thought it was Kawasaki's. I mean, that was the case that I saw with Dr. Argo, too. But it doesn't seem to be playing a role in therapy for him. I didn't see that anywhere. Yeah, one thing that I read said that you you maybe could, but I think steroids are still the first option, but you know, if they weren't. But yeah, in our case, he got better, but I think he had Kawasaki, you know, I think he had dress so. Yeah. yeah, typically everybody gets better on IPIG. That's right. <laughs> it's yeah. That's interesting, though. I didn't see anybody try just IPIG for drugs. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think they have in the past, but I think current therapy is to do steroids, because that's what they're they were already doing IVIG in our patients, so they were asking, should we stop it and start steroids? And we were like, no, I mean, the kid's getting better, and it doesn't sound like dress anymore. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Good job. Thank you. Day. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.